Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to an Innovate discussion panel. Today, we're going to be looking at education and its intersection with AV. I have a full panel of people who actually deal with AV in education, and they're going to introduce themselves. Uh, so my name is Nikesh Kapadia. I'm the audiovisual delivery manager for RMIT. Hi, I'm Scott Doyle. I'm the AV manager from Swinburne University and also have a very bad voice today, sorry. And I'm Kieran Pabu from Victoria University. Uh, I'm the services coordinator. I look after the IT desktop support and the AV teams. So as someone who is not from the Australian AV industry, my first question is what gives Australian universities the appetite to embark on mega projects like super labs, cubes, spheres, which we've all covered previously and they all look amazing. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I think uh, Australian um, universities really try and set themselves apart from uh, a lot of other universities and trying to get students really in and saying, well, you know what, I'm really excited about these spaces. I want to go and learn there. And I think uh, what we're really investing in is students. That's where the investment sits. So how we separate ourselves from um, each of the universities uh, really is the facilities that we can provide them. Uh, yeah, totally agree with uh, what Nikesh is saying there. Um, for us, I'll give you an example. We did a um, cyber security operations centre uh, in partnership with Cisco. And um, if you Google it, it's one of a kind. Um, you know, it's not just the AV, it's, it's about the learning and the teaching and, and the experience for the student at the end of the day. And we went above and beyond with that project in particular, but um, by adding, you know, LED lights as well as, you know, video walls and all the latest and greatest technology. But it's really about trying to engage the student to want to come to that university and study that degree and what separates it from the other universities. Yeah, and I guess what I've seen, like, as the AETM president and going around visiting lots of universities, AV's changed from us providing a service to the students. Now, as Nikesh was saying, we're providing a service to attract the students as well. So um, small things about the aesthetics of the space and, and not so much the technology is really important. So we're making AV be more aesthetic as well. Um, and that really helps with the student numbers and enrolments. So obviously the big mega projects that we were just discussing, they attract students, but you've got tons of other AV systems and products deployed across that might not be in, at the forefront in the same manner. How do you guys go about measuring the return on investment for systems like that, systems that enable students to act in the spaces, learn and interact and collaborate with each other? Yep, so um, Victoria University has really changed the way that it teaches. So traditionally, universities will have four subjects happening concurrently. Victoria University has changed that into a block mode approach. So what that means is they'll do one subject um, four weeks intensive to really simplify and um, reduce the stress on the student to be able to take, undertake subjects. Um, so in, in regards to Victoria University, we've gone for the full collaboration style approach, meaning you know, pods at desks. Um, there might be six people to a desk surrounded by a pod with wireless presentation, cable connections, using the latest and greatest technology. And um, for us, it, the return on investment is student retention. We really struggle in the past with student retention and, um, and then the, also um, individual marks of students. So the averages for Victoria University were quite low in the past. And as we move towards this collaboration style approach, we're finding that we're retaining a lot more students and the medium um, pass rate has gone from a pass rate to you know high distinctions distinctions so that's where AV has helped engage the student and create team environments and collaboration style learning. I think um, one of the other areas um, that we need to consider is social media as well because as students uh, use certain spaces if they're really excited about the way they can learn and teach, I think, uh, you know, they'll then put that in through social media, which obviously has a massive reach. So from a marketing standpoint, I think we, um, we also need to look at that from a uh, return on investment as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll add to the social media part. Um, I regularly um, monitor Facebook for, for faults in my spaces, funny enough. And uh, 
Um, it is a, it's something the students do. They, they talk quite a lot about what other universities have as well on their Facebook. You see, you know, what Monash has, it's a really great AV system, but yeah, the escalators at Swinburne can't even work, so how could the AV work and things like that. So the social media part these days puts a lot more pressure on the AV solutions to, to be more engaging for the students. Definitely. And on, on, in the corporate sector, people are talking about the increasing number of millennials and the generation after that that's going to join into the workforce, but they're not implementing strategies around it because there's still a little bit of buffer time. I think on your end, especially in tertiary education, there is no buffer time. These guys are entering universities for higher education right now, and they have such a different relationship with technology. They're natives, they use it, and they want to use it in, in their in their manner, in their fashion. How are you guys having to support this completely different approach to technology where they're actually demanding things to be changed and things to fit their needs rather than just making do with what's available? Yeah. And that's, that's a huge challenge for us because we've got, at RMIT, we've got so many spaces that um, how, do you, how do you make that, what's that approach look like to then go through all of those rooms and, and uplift as well? So. Um, you know, I've got a five and a half year old in prep and he's just natively swiping um, screens and you think, okay, well that was never something I would have thought of and in, in primary school or anything like that. So once they get to uh, higher education, what's their expectation going to be at that point? And how do we then forward plan for that, um, for that time? So it's definitely a huge challenge um, that we see in our area and um, I, think, I think everybody is going to see that that real um, that challenge and I guess the other part too is like after that stage we've now also got the students requiring the new digital workspace and we're finding in IT that's a, a new a new term that's being thrown around a lot so digital workplace digital workspace instead of being an IT team or an AV team all of a sudden we're a digital workspace team and that's real drive to make sure that our graduates are you know corporate level ready um, and that I think push is going to get much much more over the next few years to make sure that, you know, that digital workspace is something that we're delivering in all our AV classrooms. Yeah, look, I totally agree with what my other co-panelists have say, said in that space. Um, for us, um, yeah, it's quite challenging to continue to um, maintain and upgrade in alignment with learning and teaching. Um, we're finding that, you know, we're reducing lecture theatre spaces, we're going to more collaboration style, uh, intimate spaces, more informal huddle spaces. Uh, these big sort of one-to-many type teachings are, are starting to fade off for Victoria University. And it's showing great benefits um, in the long run. As I mentioned before, retention rates are, are increasing. Um, so yeah, definitely as we move forward, we, we really have to stay in alignment with learning and teaching and the industry and the latest and greatest technology, um, which is very, very difficult because it's always changing. Collaboration is such an interesting space and, and personally, I believe that the perfect collaboration tool doesn't exist on the market. It's, it's almost, it, it's so nebulous, it's so hard to define, it's so hard to pin down that the, mark, the, that the manufacturers aren't able to deliver a product that can do everything. How are you guys enabling collaboration in your spaces? What kind of products are you looking at? And is there something that maybe that's not on the market that you would like to see made available to you guys so you can do what you want to do? From um, from our standpoint, um, yeah, we're seeing a huge uptake in, in collaboration in collaboration environments, and uh, building the right environment for collaboration is um, is extremely challenging. And obviously, we're also driven by you know if we're putting in a, a, a new environment that we've got architects that you know may think well this would be good for collaboration, but where is that driven from? Um, and so. Yeah, I think collaboration takes so many different forms that how do we pin down one type to then deliver to students? You know, do we need to look at going, okay, well, there are several different rooms that we can work in different ways for collaboration. Um, you know, I think we're also looking from an RMIT standpoint, what's that wireless connectivity look like as well? And um, what's something that's going to be able to be used across all platforms and I think, um, Apple's really defined what wireless uh, presentation is by uh, Apple TV because it was just so simple, or is so simple, but then we need to go, okay, well, what does that look like from a corporate environment and how do we enable that? So um, wireless presentation is a big one 
big one for us and you know the speed at which you know there's minimal lag and things like that as well uh, yeah it, totally in agreement with that um, to be straight there is no perfect you know wireless presentation tool out there um, we benchmarked heaps of different products and chose what we thought was the best one for our university um, we're finding more that it's moving more away from just wireless presentation and it's getting additional features such as like digital signage when they're not in use from our um, you know marketing sector or um, polling doing polls on those um, pods because all the pods have wireless connectivity on it um, so more and more it's getting increasingly challenging to keep up with the demands but um, yeah it's very hard to find one device that ticks all the boxes essentially yeah and that's the part I was going to say like interoperability between a different range of software products and hardware is such a, a big thing a lot of universities are still stuck in sort of a two or three different software platform mode and trying to juggle what we're trying to do where some of the universities have been able to sort of force it through and say yep we're only going to be on this platform etc so a lot of products here actually cover everything that we want to do but you can't easily just swap them from one to the other um, so we're sort of trying to still back to the old days of putting a whole lot of AV black boxes together to make an AV system work. We feel like we're doing that in the collaboration space if our organisation hasn't streamlined their platform. So I'd like to see more products that are actually a little bit more user friendly and, and, and allow a little bit more variability. Because once, I mean, but we're not going to see it because the products want to lock us in. I can understand that. But uh, I still think there's a bigger market out there to um, you know, have a more of an open standard for what we can do and change between platforms. Yeah, interoperability is a big thing and it's one of my pet peeves as well. And you almost get locked into a silo and then you're stuck in the silo and getting out of the silo requires such a heavy investment that it's just not economically feasible most of the times. Um, just staying on collaboration for a bit more, what do you guys think about the content sharing um, and, and bringing up uh, information and, and sharing that between teachers and students. Are you happy with where the industry is at right now and what's available on market? Or would you like to see something more? Is Office 365 being supported? Can I like seamlessly bring up a Word document, bring it down, bring up presentation? Where's, where are we at with that? Uh, yeah, so for Victoria University, we use um, Kramer Vias as our wireless uh, presentation tools. Um, and we benchmarked a product quite a few of them, as I mentioned before. And connectivity is always a big issue. Um, in regards to the product doing what it should be doing in terms of casting, um, screen sharing, sending to different areas, I think that it does it and it meets the needs of the business quite quite fine. It's just the um, experience on the end user at the end of the day on how they connect, how they share, and how user friendly it is, as Scott mentioned before. Um, so that's something that um, I'd like to see improvements in. It'd be nice just to just be able to walk into a room and just a sort of one touch to go type approach. Um, similar to Cisco proximity, if anyone's used that, but um, you know, minus the, the laggy delays and that sort of thing. But uh, yeah, I think moving forward, it's definitely heading in the right direction. Um, I think also as we move towards BYOD for students as well, you know, we've gone from big uh, spaces that had PCs that were on all desks to, um, to then students bringing their own devices and, and that, um, that alone brings out challenges of, okay, well everyone's got a different version of an operating system, does it support this version of Miracast that's out there or, or <clears throat> how do we um, ensure that they've got software deployed to their machine um, to do this wireless connectivity and does it work natively for them? Um, and then you've got laptops and tablets and phones and, and, um, and how to ensure that their experience is the same as the students next to them's experience. So um, then we also need to look at the academics that want to be decoupled from a, a lectern or a teacher's station and how they interact with, um, with their students. And I think that makes a di big difference to um, collaboration as well, because if, uh, if you've got a, an academic that's sitting at the, the front of the room saying, you should go and do this these group to these groups, are we really collaborating from that standpoint? The students might be collaborating, but how much are they working with the academics as well? We've also seen a lot of trends kind of mature over the last five to three years. Um, AV over IP being the most prominent one, right? We now have AV over IP products. They're widely available. They're second, third, fourth generation products now. Um, what impact has this had on, 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 on your spaces? 
and more importantly, what impact has this had on you guys future proving your assets and, 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 and making sure that there's an upgrade path available for you guys? Um, Victoria University hasn't gone down that path, um, committed to that path as yet. We're still operating a bit in the past. We're waiting to see more where the industry goes. Uh, we have planned it in some of our new products, uh, projects such as the City West Tower, uh, which will be all based on AV over IP. But at the moment, we're still benchmarking. So RMIT's gone down the AV over IP path quite quite heavily since about uh, 2015, when a decision was made to, to move down that down that road. And um, we've seen some really some great benefits that have that come from that. And um, one of the big uh, items is asset refresh, uh, because as we've standardised on uh, H.264 as our method of, of streaming, we can then say, all right, well. Uh, today we've got this box, tomorrow we need to refresh this room, what's another um, encoder or decoder that's able to do H.264 streaming and based on the fact that H.264 is so um, such a, a standard across the, uh, across the world, we can go and uh, have, our, have our choice of, of what we want to use. So AV over IP um, has been um, it's been a big journey <laughs> for us, There's, uh, there are definitely um, a lot of uh, speed humps as you as you go down that path, and but we work through a lot of that. And even um, if we looked at server-based control as part of AV over IP, so it's not just audio and video that we need to think about. It's the the control side, and um, and how we can benefit from that uh, in our spaces. We um, essentially have a, a HTML5 page that's loaded into a into a touch panel. And so if we want to do global changes, we can do that very, very quickly. Um, we recently had to make one across our entire fleet. And um, so we've got our standard rooms that aren't converged AV rooms yet, and then our converged rooms, and we're able to do those converged rooms uh, within you know, a half an hour. We're able to change 150 rooms, there, what their touch panel looked like. In the other rooms, it's the traditional style where you have to go get the code, change the code, re-upload, and even from that standpoint, we uh, we saw the benefit. So, uh, yeah. yeah, it's interesting, like knowing the RMIT's journey because you started so long ago, being such a big university. Whereas I've gone to a small university with no AV over IP essentially, and uh, what's fit for purpose for us is is good at the moment, but. I think will be dictated by the market coming into the future and we won't have a choice. I mean, you can keep it local, you can keep it on the network, but at the end of the day, the black boxes still look exactly the same with a different chip in them. So, you know, I think, you know, for my, my part and I think for a lot of other people going down this journey, like there is a big budget saving. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the finance side, big budget saving over a long period of time, but a heavy resource budget cost at the start um, and making sure not just the technology, but the service management and the, the whole service desk fleet and every all the staff are trained in that the new sort of uh, next generation AV as we call it. So it's a really big consideration most people have to think about. Um, and when you've got a split fleet for a while, that's that management cost that's still there. While you're saving a little bit of money to, to get 150 rooms converted easy, costing a big resource to do the legacy stuff. So that upfront resource over you know, five years to do a refresh is, is still something that I think is probably not considered enough sometimes. Um, and has to be planned well out in advance. Yeah, definitely. There is still a very strong case to be made for for traditional matrices in particular applications and, and, and in particular setups. Um, the last topic that I'd like to discuss with you guys is what the future holds for tertiary education and AV with respect to the kind of technologies that we can expect to see augmented reality, virtual reality, holograms. These are all things that are being considered and, and people are trialing them out and, and seeing how what the response from students is to them. Uh, just the panel's thoughts on where they see the future at and what technologies they feel might make an impact in education. Um, yeah, so for VU, um, definitely we're heading down that road. We've already in implemented AR and VR, and it's more in our tech schools. So we have partnerships with um, the government to have tech schools, which primary uh, school students come out to and visit and get hands-on experience using VR and AR, and also coding and how to build these things, because you know programming is the way of the future. Um, so they're starting from a very 
young age nowadays to get experience in this technology and bring it all the way up through to tertiary education. Um, in the tertiary side of things, we're seeing it a massive uptake in some of our, we, we're a dual sector university, so we do TAFE and higher ed. Uh, and definitely on the TAFE side, it seems that AV, VR, um, AR is all making a massive, um, you know, stint um, across the board. Um, these spaces are fully immersive um, and heading in that direction. Um, collaboration seems to be the status quo for us now. Um, and then with the additions of VR, AR and that sort of thing. Um, we're also looking at uh, holographic projection. That's something um, very new to BU and it goes with our engineering type courses and our you know, CAD programs and that sort of thing. Um, so more and more we're looking for more of this innovation type technologies and different things other than just projectors or panels and that sort of thing. So if there's other ways to display content and enable a student's you know, work to be shown at the end of the day, then we're all about trying to go for that product and, and enhance the learning. And it's quite appealing, all this stuff too, so it really drags, uh, draws the student into the university, whether it's the TAFE side or the higher ed side. Yeah, I'm Swinburne's also dual sector, and I think our most technology advanced school will be the plumbing department by the end of this year. They'll have the most VR headsets out of everybody, and we'll have thousands of headsets by the end of this year. Um, so yeah, that, that new way of teaching for all the TAFE, so I think it'd be carpentry next and even electrical work, they're all doing it and want to do it over VR. Um, the content creations are happening really quickly in that sector as well. And the biggest hurdle to, to think about in that area is it's actually not AV anymore. It yeah. really is educational technology. And as a service management uh, part of my role is that we're now struggling with who actually supports AR and VR. Um, and the quickly upskill of so many different areas, the service desk, the support staff on the ground, even the local techs in those areas are all having a quick skill um, uplift you know, just to cope with this new technology. Yeah, look, we're also seeing that, that uptake into VR and AR as well. And if you look across other universities, apart from RMIT, that uh, they're looking at the cave installations and, and how much they're investing in those sorts of implementations. And then you've got uh, people dedicated to creating content for those solutions as well. So there's definitely a shift, um, a heavy shift into, into that area for uh, benefiting students. Um, we've seen um, a, a, a small shift from um, dedicated schools into VR and AR and um, also how they're creating, um, you know, it's uh, through our Design and Social Context College and uh, they're able to create what they need by actually seeing it before they've even made it, you know, and, and there's, uh, they've created some videos around this which looks absolutely amazing. So it's definitely an area that's, um, that's on the up for us. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time.